Hello there, beloved Evergreen History of Motion Picture students. This is Mr. Hebert, and today uh, you need to be taking some notes, a uh, good amount of notes here, so uh, quite often you may need to pause and catch up on things, and that's why there's the beauty of this video thing. So um, we are in the silent period still, of course. We are coming to a close pretty soon of the silent period. And we've talked about some significant film movements and cultures. We talked about, of course, America and France. Last week we talked about Russia. And now we're going to talk about the other serious powerhouse of of the uh, of the silent period, and that is Germany, and particularly when we talk about German film in the silent period, uh, we're particularly focusing on German expressionism and what that film movement is about, why it came about, uh, what its style is, and how it still influences uh, later genres and and the look and feel of films today. So make sure you've got a piece of paper, make sure you're ready to go, pause this video if needed, and away we go. So first of all, not that people weren't making films in Germany before, but if we're talking about expressionism, we need to go back a little bit uh, from the 1920s into the teens during World War One. Now, of course, um, filmmaking during a wartime period is is such an important thing to to keep in mind, and um, and the thing is that the United Kingdom, Italy, France, they had a pretty strong film in infrastructure going into World War One, um, but when we get into World War One, feature film production pretty much comes to a standstill for France, Italy, and the UK. Um, their facilities are destroyed. A lot of their resources were basically turned over into the war effort. If you kind of remember, not that Méliès was still making a lot of films at this time, but if you remember George Méliès, uh, a lot of his films were destroyed, and others as well, were melted down for the silver nitrate, uh, to make boot heels for the soldiers. Now, there were films being made. Um, this was the first time that film was being used to bring um, images of the battle and of the aftermath to audiences who were away from the front lines, kind of like newsreels and documentaries. Um, but the most, the two countries most affected by World War I uh, coming out of it would be uh, Germany and Russia. So like we talked about with Russia last week coming out of World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution and how it affected the film production and especially the film style, same thing would happen with Germany, just with a different kind of approach. So when World War I uh, is going on, about 1917, the German military supreme command took control of all of the film studios in Germany, or nearly all of them, nearly all of them. And they consolidated it all into what is called UFA. And that stands for Universum Film Actien Gesellschaft. That's right, you said it. Now you heard it. Universum Film Actien Gesellschaft. No, I am not going to ask you to have that on a test. Just call it UFA. Even the Germans still call it UFA. Okay? And, um, and anyway, uh, this was in 1917. They took control of the film industry for the, the most part. And they're going to make nationalist films. These are going to be pro-German, pro-government type of films. So there are a few independent production companies out there. Um, they're going to be very hard to compete with UFA. But notice this is uh, very similar to what would happen with, with Russia, with the, the Narkompros and uh, how they took over the, the film industry uh, in Russia. Uh, 
however, the Germans are going to have a better footing because when they come out of World War I, um, the film infrastructure in Germany, despite being the losers of the war, they actually were in much better shape as far as filmmaking goes. All other parts of their, of their economy was in the dumps, but, but their film infrastructure was strong. So as they come out of World War I, um, one of the first types of films that the uh, UFA studio is making are what are called costume films, which basically means costume films. So they are historical pieces, um, you know, kind of this ornate production design. Uh, these are the kinds of films that they are making um, with big budget stuff. Probably the most noted filmmaker out of the costume film uh, period is a director named Ernst Lubitsch. And he was known for his huge crowd scenes, his uh, pioneer in artificial lighting. Uh, he was known for sophisticated comedies. And something we're going to see quite often, he was the first high-profile director to emigrate to the United States after the Nazis, or in fear of the Nazis coming to power, which they did in 1933. Um, and then he would continue to make films in America. That's actually something we're going to see with a lot of filmmakers and artists in Germany, as we're getting closer to the end of the 20s and into the 30s and the rise of fascism and Nazis and Adolf Hitler, um, you have a lot of filmmakers and artists who get out and they go to London, they go to New York, and a lot of them come to Hollywood. Um, and when they do come, they bring a lot of those European sensibilities to the films they make here. So this is Ernst Lubitsch, who just started in Germany and uh, later came to the United States to make films and brought a lot of those styles with him. The post-World War I period in Germany is known as the Weimar period. In German, the W is a V, Vi, Weimar period. And it's imperial rule. It's, it's, a, it's a new Republican government. Um, and they got a lot of problems. Okay, they, they lost the war. So there's a lot of problems here. There's hyperinflation. So things are costing a lot of money. There's a lot of political extremism. Uh, people are very frustrated. It's out of this kind of extremism that you have uh, the rise of Adolf Hitler. He, that, that sort of anger and frustration is uh, makes it ripe for that kind of fanaticism. Uh, violence, of course, coming out of that uh, frustration. And a lot of deeply troubled relationships with the countries that won World War I, um, particularly France and Great Britain. So a lot of problems there in Germany during the Weimar period. But as I said, they had a huge film infrastructure in place. They had the facilities, um, they had uh, those resources, and they were the only ones in Europe really to have this kind of infrastructure. Even the Russians with all of their enthusiasm to nationalize film, if you recall, they, they, you know, they took control of these studios, but they didn't even have film stock so they had to study these other films and re-edit them and all sorts of things. So as we go into the late teens and the beginning of the 1920s, so about um, about 100 years ago, uh, that's, that's what's happening with Germany. And here's basically what we have with Europe and the film market. You've got Hollywood kind of going, ah, it's the end of the Great War. Now, no film industry can compete with us in Europe. And then the German UFA says, Yeah, that's what you think, Air Hollywood Studio. German film actually lasted very strong after the war. Okay, that's my best German accent. Don't judge me. Okay, so by the end uh, of the teens, with UFA in place and all the other uh, European film studios and the film industries besides Germany out of the market, this is basically what you have. And UFA has the resources and the facilities, not just to be the best in Europe, but they are competing with Hollywood. In fact, um, UFA becomes the largest film studio, uh, movie studio in the world. So 
this is a major player on the film, the world cinema market here. Okay. Now, you've got UFA, okay? You've got UFA, and it's this major, major uh, studio. But there were a few, like I said, there were a few little production companies out there, and they're doing their best to, you know, to make it work, okay? So you had this little independent film company called Decla, and this is the logo that Decla had, the little animation, the little raven comes out and, you know, sits on the letters there. And like the the only few kind of independent film companies out there, they couldn't really compete with UFA. They didn't have that kind of budget and and the resources and and, and those kinds of things. Um, they even had to worry about lighting because electricity was rationed. <laughs> so you talk about like powering just lights for a studio. You're even limited in what you can do there. So at Decla, there was this film that was made. That was not a huge budget, but it was so creative and so groundbreaking in its style, it got people's attention, and it is one of the most monumentally important films, not only in German cinema, but in world cinema. And that film is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. We're celebrating its 100th year anniversary this year. Now... The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is this really creative, inventive, kind of whacked out film, but it's it's just, it's like nothing else that people had seen. And even nowadays, if people watch it, not kind of, even even if they kind of know what uh, what to expect, it's, it's, it's a different kind of experience, let me just tell you. Um, it takes place... In, in kind of this, um, you know, like a couple hundred years ago and in this uh, village and there's this festival, kind of carnival that goes by and all these different booths and there's this somnambulist named Cesare who is uh, sort of controlled by Dr. Caligari and the people come in and a somnambulist, by the way, is a sleepwalker. So Cesare is supposed to be sort of in this 20 year old trance and he can see the future and he's predicting people's deaths and it's got like horror elements and it's a murder mystery and it's just it's it's fascinating to look at even if you just look at it from the camera um i'm sure i should should say the production design and the choices in in the in the sets and the wardrobe it is like no other film that that people had made to that time. And I would say uh, very little has come close to it at, even now. Um, it's a dark kind of film. It's a strange kind of film. And it's the sort of the forerunner and, and pinnacle of what German expressionism is. It was written by two guys, uh, Hans Janowicz, and Carl Mayer, and it was based on their experiences as soldiers in World War I and their distrust for authoritarian leadership. Um, That's one of the things you see in Caligari is it's these two young men are the main characters, and there's this love interest with one of them, uh, with this young woman, and then it's all done in the inner mind of this of this guy that may be insane, and you know this this like back and forth about like control uh, and 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 controlling others through the somnambulist. And so I don't want to give away too much because it has a, a real like oh my gosh kind of ending. Um, but yeah, if you look at it through that lens, you can definitely appreciate it. Um, the director of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is Robert Vine. I want to make sure you have his name down there. And probably the most celebrated part uh, artistically, we'll get into sort of the themes and the psychology of it and all, um, is the mise-en-scene. Remember, mise-en-scene means placing in the scene. It means everything that's physical in the shot. It's the props, it's the costumes, it's the sets, it's the casting, it's the gestures, it's the makeup, it's the lighting, 
Um, it's all of those things. That's what makes up the mise-en-scene. And in Caligari, it does not do mise-en-scene realistically. In fact, expressionism is very much a revolt against realism. It, it's like there's D.W. Griffith, which is things like, like natural and realistic. Uh-uh. Expressionism is so on the other side of that spectrum. Everything is done rather expressionistically. In other words, what it would be to experience this in the head of a particular character. See, expressionism is very, very, very much about the psychology of, of a character and, and to visualize that psychology. So everything in the, in the film is very exaggerated. Um, the whole production design is deliberately distorted and, and it's intentionally artificial. Okay, it is intentionally artificial. You've got um, like desks and chairs and doors that are intentionally too tall, and you've got these impossibly peaked roofs, and and everything looks very theatrical and artificial. You've got shafts of light that are painted on the set. The makeup is intentionally very pale faced and dark eyed makeup. Um, even the gestures, particularly with Cesare, is very exaggerated. It gives it this kind of super creepy thing. And um, again, it's all about the inner psychology of these characters, which is called subjective filmmaking. Objective filmmaking is realistic, natural. Subjective filmmaking is, I want to see it through the eyes and the mind of that filmmaker. Uh, I'm sorry, through that character. So with Caligari, you've got like four main things that are, if they're not firsts, they are this, the more significant firsts. The anti-authoritarian themes, the exaggerated mise-en-scene, that subjective point of view, and a twist ending. Those four things make this a powerhouse story. It's a little bit weird. I've I have shown it to film classes before. Um, it it definitely takes a mindset of okay, I'm going to watch something that's very very different. Um, and the storyline, I mean, it you can follow the storyline, but it takes all sorts of twists and turns that you're like, wait, what in the world is going on? And uh, but uh, you get to the kind of the end, and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, cool, and you appreciate the experience. Uh, probably the most significant performer in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is Conrad Veidt. And he plays Cesare the Somnambulist. And um, like I said, not only directors, but different artists and performers, a lot of them would leave Europe because of the threat of fascism and the war. Well, definitely fascism. And they would go to places like England or America. And Conrad Veidt actually came to America and... Um, uh, he was known for uh, like really strong either antagonists or um, kind of supporting roles. Um, he's in the 1940 version of The Thief of Baghdad as the bad guy. Um, he's also in Casablanca. So uh, he had a he had a very good career even going into um, uh, coming to America. Uh, his career remained strong. He wasn't like a lead actor, but uh, he was definitely recognizable and respected by others. Now, the cinematographer, because a lot of these German films are known for their look, Carl Freund is the cinematographer for The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, and Carl Freund will also be the cinematographer for uh, another renowned film from the German silent period called Metropolis. Uh, he also would come to America and direct a little bit, uh, but mostly concentrate on cinematography when he came to America. Uh, he directed the original Universal film of The Mummy, starring Boris Karloff in 1931, 32, somewhere in there. Um, and then when television came around, uh, he moved into cinematography for television, um, and he pioneered what is now a staple of a sitcom. Uh, he pioneered the three-camera setup for uh, sitcom filming in front of a live audience, and he did that with a little-known situation comedy called I Love Lucy. 
So it's kind of interesting to think that the guy that was helping to be in, uh, in, in filming the cabinet of Dr. Caligari Metropolis was also the guy who pioneered sitcom uh, camera work in I Love Lucy in the 1950s. We really need to kind of see a crossover with that. Now, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari was not an immediate kind of hit, um, but filmmakers really picked up on it. Um, and that exaggerated mise-en-scene became the hallmark uh, for German cinema in the Weimar period. Um, in fact, in 1923, which is just a few years after Caligari, uh, Ufa would merge with Dekla. And as they get into the 20s, um, they're... they're, they're starts to get some financial and economic crisis with um, uh, with German cinema. Um, has to do with certain economic deals that they end up making. Um, and we're going to see some significant films that come out of the German cinema period, and which we're going to talk more in depth. You've got, of course, um, the films of Fritz Lang and the films of F.W. Murnau, uh, which we're going to focus more on uh specifically, but, um, but it's really that, that Caligari got it all started. So here's what I would like you to do. Let's now take the trip into the cabinet, shall we? What I would like you to do is to stop this video and there should be an attached video where there's a clip of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And let me just set this up a little bit. In this part of the movie, uh, one of the young men is suspicious of Dr. Caligari and Cesare. There's already been a couple of deaths, murders, but they don't know who has done it. He suspects that Cesare is behind it. So he's sort of like staking out in Caligari's bedroom, bungalow, where Cesare sleeps and almost like this coffin inside there. And uh, so he's watching like, okay, but there's Cesare who just stays there. But Cesare is out and about and he's lurking and he's trying to uh, get in where the young lady uh, is. And as you watch it, you're going to see, uh, you know, again, it's all about this psychological trip. Okay. And um, notice the artificial, uh, intentionally artificial and exaggerated mise-en-scene. All right, so stop the video, and when you're ready, come on back. All right, at this point, I'm assuming that you have checked out the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Caligari there with the, uh, like, exaggerated Mickey Mouse gloves that I love. Those are, those are so very, very cool. All right. So let's get uh, some important notes here. You're going to probably need to pause on a lot of these things, but that's totally cool. All right, so let's talk about some important themes that we see in expressionist films, real expressionist films. One of the most significant, and remember, this is all about this is all about the psychology, the subjective storytelling here. Okay, and um, the the idea is that we're going to visualize the dreams and the nightmares and the psyche. Um, Sigmund Freud, who did, um, you know, his work with with psychology, you know, psychology and the id and the ego and the superego. Um, this is only within like ten or fifteen years of that, so this is still new. But people are greatly influenced by this. So, how do I visualize the mindset? Of this, how do I visualize fear or anxiety or um, or jealousy and these sorts of things? And going along with that, it's a visualization of the subconscious mind. We're going to see that the Germans become really the the premier world cinema in the twenties of pure visual storytelling, trying to tell as much as possible through visuals. Now, one of the things that they are much more concerned about is the emotion and the psychology than the action. So, again, plots, you might feel, are a little bit detached. I would not say that that's a fault of storytelling. That's just they're more focused on the emotions and how we glide from one emotion to another in different scenarios. 
going along with this. Again, a lot of overlap here. The inner feelings and the personal reality as opposed to outer feelings and impersonality. That's what we see focused on here. As we said before, this is a revolt against realism. It's not D.W. Griffith's kind of approach. This is total anti-Griffith, or I should say very different from Griffith, and also authority. A lot of You see a lot of expressionist films where the idea of like oppression and control, it doesn't have necessarily be government, although you do see that you know, certainly in films like Metropolis, but uh, in even a more kind of psychological control, um, like in films like, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Nosferatu, or um, like social culture control, like in The Last Laugh uh, by F.W. Murnau. Um, things like eroticism and physical love, uh, these are seen as very primal. These are often seen as evil. Um, alternative realities, um, this idea that uh, not about objective reality, but subjective realities, or at least subjective experiences of realities, and therefore people's different idea of truth. And as I said, subjectivity and uncertainty Pretty most expressionist films are not warm and fuzzy. Okay, Frank Capra, who did *It's a Wonderful Life*, for example, and if you haven't seen that this Christmas season, go do yourself a favor. Um, this is not Frank Capra or even you know like Walt Disney. There's a lot of anxiety and fear and uncertainty that runs throughout um, expressionist films. Now, of course, things don't happen in a vacuum. There's a lot of influences on expressionism in film. And expressionism is not limited to Germany. We see expressionism in other art forms. We, we will begin to see it in other films uh, outside of Germany. Um, and we see expressionism kind of happening in other art forms even before this. Um, like I said, the psychological studies of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung... Um, that was a huge, huge influence on what expressionism is about. Um, what's called Autorin film, which was like German art film of the 1910s. Okay, kind of like the costume film, but a little bit different. Uh, fantasy films of pre-war Germany. Fantasy films going, when I say pre-war, World War I. Um, again, the idea of alternative realities going beyond realism. In literature, German Romanticism, like the Brothers Grimm or Friedrich Schiller, uh, these ideas, sort of like flights of fancy, um, and, and a lot of morality tales come out of Expressionism too, and that's where you get like the, the Brothers Grimm. By the way, if you are interested in Grimm's fairy tales, and you've not read original Grimm's fairy tales, I don't mean the original German, but if you haven't, I highly recommend that you do that because um, I think that you will appreciate that the original stories have a little more bite to them than maybe what you've seen in cartoons or Disney or anything like that. Um, Hansel and Gretel? Hmm. Yeah, a little more violent against that witch than you might have assumed. And Cinderella? Um, I don't recall that Walt Disney decided to keep severed toes in <laughs> in his tale. He decided to leave that out. Anyway, um, a lot of economic distress, like we talked about. Uh, despite the strong film infrastructure, most people's economic distress was, uh, economic situation was very, very stressful. And of course, it's this kind of frustration that makes it ripe for somebody like Adolf Hitler to come to power. In live theater, the work of Max Reinhardt, uh, dealing with expressionist stuff, and we have expressionist paintings. You have impressionist paintings and expressionist paintings. And I think one of the best examples of expressionist paintings comes from a Scandinavian, uh, I believe Swedish painter named Edvard Munch, and it is called The Scream. And it looks like this. Notice that the composition is not balanced. It's not a kind of balanced kind of portrait. Notice how the lines are not very balanced. Everything is very askew. It is pure emotion. It is pure emotion. In the brush strokes, in the composition, in the balance of it, is that a man? Is that a woman? I can't really tell. Okay, but it is not going for realism. It is pure emotion. 
And is it fear? Is it shock? Is it surprise? I don't know what that expression expression is, but it is pure and it is primal. And so this is a good example of expressionism in painting. Now, as far as techniques and style, low key and high contrast lighting. And we talked about this last time. So a lot of um, a lot of difference between the brights and the darks. And this might work because they don't have the money for the lighting. Or this might work because it creates more of a sense of mystery and uncertainty and texture. I, whether it's intentional or not, um, it totally works. Um, because of that, an extensive use of shadows. Very sharp angles and distorted compositions. So we see that the camera is not always balanced. Maybe it's turned uh, on its, you know, kind of angled to the side. So it, you know, gives a sense of unbalance. Distorted compositions, not balanced compositions, but very distorted. As we've talked about, all the components are used in exaggerated ways. The costumes, the acting, the makeup. So if you're not aware of this and you're watching this, you might think, oh my gosh, are the, these people are so archaic. And no, this is all intentional. And an elliptical narrative style. It's not very linear sometimes. Caligari uh, kind of jumps around a little bit. Uh, Nosferatu feels like that a little bit too. Where it's not a very linear, kind of hold your audience hand through everything. It kind of goes up and down a little bit. By the way, I'm moving my hands as if you guys can see me, but... I know you can't, but this is how I how I talk. Another important theme that we see coming out of this, and this rises out of psychology, um, and we see this even earlier, is this thing called the doppelganger. Okay, doppel means double. And this can take a few different forms. It could be that a doppelganger means that there are two characters that reflect two different sides. Jekyll and Hyde is a, is a great example of that. Um, kind of the good side and the bad side. Now this comes out of psycho psychological studies where you have your id and your ego. And the id, according to Freud and Jung, it, that's kind of like your, your instinct. That's kind of like your, your animal side. Those, that's like your, your, your hunger and your thirst and these sort of urges that are, you know, are more animalistic. They're more primal. And your ego, you know, that's with your super ego kind of that's kind of like your balance. That's your rationality. That's your morality. That's what, you know, sort of your balance. So it can be a couple different ways. You might have two different characters that kind of reflect the the double side of humanity, the good and the bad. But you also see doppelganger played out where there's like a good and a bad in the same character and they're battling for control in the same character. Um, you definitely see this in, in a film like um, Metropolis uh, with the character Maria. Um, you definitely see it in Caligari. Um, like I said, it can be external doppelgangers and it can be internal doppelgangers. This whole idea of the battle between good and bad inside uh, inside that character. This is something that Sigmund Freud talked a lot about. Um, it's also something that the Bible talks about, but comes to different conclusions. Um, you know, the Bible teaches that we are born sinful and that the Holy Spirit comes in, but there's still that that conflict. Um, it's not about who will win. Um, it's about who we will allow to win. Okay. But we're kind of, we're, but what I'm talking about here, of course, is, you know, where, where expressionism falls in all of this. I think as, as believers, we can watch a lot of these films and actually have much greater insight than, than um, maybe audiences who, who don't have that background. So it didn't last, guys. It didn't last in its pure way. It lasted in a different way. Um, what happens is um, that Ufa, um, uh, it, there was a lot of economic problems with, um, with Germany by the mid-1920s. They still were, like I said, turning out some, some really important films in the 20s um, and 
Anna Boleyn with by Ernst Lubitsch and E.A. DuPont's Variety, G.W. Babs Joyless Street, we talked about Last Laugh, and Metropolis and Nosferatu. Um, and, but it doesn't last, mostly because of money. One thing, the reason it declined was a lot of the talent in the crew, the artists, the directors, the filmmakers, the actors, they left. A lot of them, like I said, went to England, some went to New York, um, and some to Hollywood. So they left, but they took those sensibilities, the German filmmaking ideas with them. Now, the business practices, this actually hurt the export trading advantage that it once had. So what this means is um, they, they started putting quotas on, on the films that they produced and how many films could be exported to other outside of outside of Germany. Now, this is important to understand because films make money not from what's shown here, but in, in other countries. Um, right now, Hollywood actually makes, like a Hollywood film would make a majority of its money outside of the United States. Um, so this is important to, to keep in mind. There was this thing called the Dawes Plan, uh, where the United States kind of moved in and said, well, we're going to help Germany get back on its feet. But by doing that, it, I mean, it was good for the economy, but it, this, like I said, it would end up being bad for filmmaking. And the the UFA studio um, uh, got in, in big trouble. Um, by the mid-20s, it was hard to get distribution, which means it was hard to get loans from banks. And um, it ended up, they, you know, a lot of these independent studios and even UFA uh, having to declare bankruptcy. Not quite yet. That took a lot longer, but a lot of these other studios had to de declare bankruptcy. Uh, bankruptcy. And what's happening is all these Hollywood films are just flooding the German market. So they're just like taking out the box office from these local Germans. Eventually, UFA would be purchased by Alfred Hugenberg, who believed that the films should be like for German nationalism, kind of going back to what they wanted to do in World War One, And then um, by the early 30s, Hitler comes to power. And uh, Hugenberg actually supported Hitler. And the fascists did what all fascists do. And they took over the entire film industry and made it for propaganda. And that's really what we get here. Um, when by the early 30s, the, the UFA system is, is starting to fall apart. There are a couple of good films that come out of the early 30s. But when Hitler comes to power, he halted current film production. Uh, Hitler was a great admirer of, of cinema. Um, he, he, he adored film, and he absolutely understood the power of cinema. But he wanted it to be strictly for his propaganda and his message. So when he comes to power, boom, the Weimar period is done. Um, and that those years there, 1918 to 1933, that's your expressionist period, pretty much too. Uh, maybe a little bit early by the late 20s, but yep, when Hitler comes to power, the artistry that we see from the, the German film is done. But the influence of it has did not. Um, you watch any horror film from the 30s, 40s, or 50s, or film noir, or even nowadays, I would say the filmmaker that's most influenced by expressionism is Tim Burton. You, you watch a Tim Burton film, you're, you're watching a great influence of, 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 uh, of German expressionism. Um, and like I said, you a lot of these filmmakers came to America to... to um, to make films, and they brought the German sensibilities with them. Look at the universal horror films of the early 30s, the noir period of the 40s and the 50s, um, even kind of like studio melodramas like Douglas Sirk's All That Heaven Allows from 1955 is greatly influenced by Expressionism. Uh, those of you who are fans of Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, oh my gosh, just watch that. That's like, like, that's like they just took the sets right out of Caligari at times. So 
um, we're definitely still still seeing it. Um, and, and not just in those types of films. I could go on and on about other ones here. Um, I, I, I won't kind of spoil it yet, but, you know, we talk about the sci-fi genre and how Metropolis uh, influences so many of those things as well. So that's German Expressionism, guys. And we're going to get more in-depth with F.W. Murnau and Fritz Lang, two filmmakers, um, whom we're going to be focusing on on Friday. And then we're going to watch a feature from Murnau. So um, I hope you guys have a great week, and um, I look forward to seeing you guys on Friday.